All right. Welcome back to your uh, podcast series, Extra AI on Machine Learning and AI Applications. And this is your host, Raghu Banda. As I have uh, promised in the past, in this season five, I have uh, now brought up a guest to talk about the influence of AI in the fintech world. Yes, we all know how fintech or financial technology has revolutionized the way we conduct our daily transactions, finance transactions, right? And with the, in, with the introduction of AI, things have become even more advanced and providing a lot more personalized services. And of course, we know how the global banking industry is getting upgraded and affected in, the, in this whole journey towards leveraging AI in the fintech world. So, as explained, I have uh, invited a guest, Mr. Satish, uh, and uh, he worked as a CPO and CPTO for some of the big organizations, and he has uh, worked across the globe. He's got a wealth of information about how all these different technologies are used in the fintech world, and he comes up with different perspectives and different experiences. So, I thought this might be a good session to get into the fintech related ai uh, podcast that we are going to do in in the future as well so as always you will find more information at the end of the podcast so sit back relax and enjoy the conversation All right, uh, welcome back to our uh, podcast series, Extra AI, Machine Learning and AI Applications. So today I have a guest, Mr. Satish. We'll be talking about the influence of AI in the fintech world. Satish is a techno-functional B2B and B2B2C fintech product executive. He has a little over 25 to 30 years experience across the industry in wide range of, uh, he's worked across different roles. Uh, recently, he had some stints as uh, CPO and CPTO, and he also lived across the world uh, globally in many of these big cities, starting from uh, Tokyo all the way to Copenhagen. So he is uh, well known and he's lived across the globe. So it's a pleasure for me to uh, interview uh, Mr. Satish. So welcome on board, Satish. Uh, would appreciate if you can give a quick uh, introduction from your end. Hey, Raghu. Good morning. Thanks for having me in this podcast. So uh, it's a privilege to be part of this podcast series that you've been doing. A lot of interesting talks on AI and how it influences our business. Um, uh, so in my remit, uh, you know, I've been, as you said, I've been in the product, uh, been fortunate to be part of the product work out of India. Uh, and uh, being from the early part of my career, worked with a leading product firm, started with City Citadel, where we built a co-banking product, which was like number one for five consecutive years globally. And uh, uh, finally, we went public and got acquired by Oracle. Uh, and subsequently, uh, during this stint, I worked in different parts of the world, working with large financial institution. Uh, so that was a great validation of what you could build and how you could uh, production proof in different parts of the world. And uh, that gave a lot of confidence and uh, city being city has a lot of great process uh, that one could learn uh, in any any product or application build. And that kind of set the foundation for me. The global exposure of however, uh, gave me great perspective on uh, how different markets are looking at it, what's important for them. And uh, when you go back to your drawing board or start building products then what are the kind of things you look at? Um, subsequently, I worked with uh, uh, SunTech, which is a relationship-based pricing. So I went back to, again, a smaller firm. Uh, and then we crossed a thousand people company, uh, you know, touched clear milestones on revenue. I was leading the EMEA portfolio. Uh, I had also a PNL responsibility because I thought that would be great. Um, and uh, during this stint, I uh, kind of, we kind of, cracked into all the tier one banks, which I was not getting an opportunity to work with my previous job. 
uh, though I worked in uh, different parts of the world in out of uh, my previous job, but here I started working with tier one accounts, uh, tier one banks like HSBC, RBS, Lloyd's Banking Group, uh, Schwab in the US, MX. And so these gave a uh, uh, very different kind of uh, complexities and uh, the way in which they were running business. Um, so here uh, we were essentially solving how business could drive more primary customers and make uh, more revenue uh, out of the uh, other methods and help improve monetization and increase the ROE. So it was a great problem to solve and uh, work with some of the best of the product managers from the bank side, CEOs, CFOs who are fundamentally focusing on getting uh, quarter on quarter numbers and how our platform could solve that. So that we use lots of data analytics and uh, business models, which we'll talk about. Mm -hmm. In the last two, three years, I've been working on, uh, got into FinTech because India was buzzing in FinTech. Mm -hmm. uh, payments was huge. Uh, so when I got an opportunity to be part of a large payment processor, to be the chief product officer, uh, I kind of just grabbed onto it uh, because uh, this is a great opportunity for you to learn uh, on what's happening on the issuer side, merchant side, uh, uh, you know, real time payments, mm -hmm. um, high volume, uh, low value payments and different kinds of uh, rails on which these payments were processed, uh, reconciliation, again, a lot of data that we were looking at and the uh, financial inclusion was coming in a big way in India as a market. So uh, th that uh, gave me a lot of perspective of uh, how you could digitize a large economy like India and mm -hmm. where we have a huge uh, spread of banked and underbanked, uh, you know, split and uh, solving for those with a lot of purpose kind of gave me a different edge. More recently, I was building a platform on spend management, which is very new uh, coming into the market. Um, again, <clears throat> with the embedded finance data. Uh, so that's where I finished it. So right now I'm working with a few deep techs and other uh, startups, consulting them, but I'm working on the transition as we speak, uh, Raghu. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great, great. great. Uh, great. That's an amazing uh, introduction and it's a very comprehensive uh, introduction. I like, uh, uh, there are a lot of aspects I really want to talk about, but I let us see how many of those things we can touch upon today. Like always, uh, how I do in these uh, podcasts to ease our uh, audience into the podcast, I start with a teaser question. So uh -huh. you have been in this uh, in this industry um, and predominantly around the banking and the payments and so on and so forth. So if you could, uh, maybe a personal or a professional experience, if you could help explain your experience in the past and how it has been enhanced uh, with AI or machine learning. I know you have been involved in a lot of these different projects or personally or professionally. If you could uh, provide one such example as a so that we can kickstart our conversation. Cool. I think there are many scenarios, many use cases. I think banking as a space is uh, fairly uh, I would say fairly one of the most complicated uh, uh, areas, uh, which has a huge uh, uh, kind of problems to be solved. And there is continuous investments on technology, but then, you know, there is a continuous uh, reimagining of those journeys that keeps happening as people try to, you know, uh, better what they have been doing. Mm -hmm. So I'll take a context in place. So uh, banking, I'll take this particular example uh, where, you know, banks were largely product centric uh, up about two decades back, you know, early 2000, uh, they were more product centric, which means business were structure based on the products they were selling. So within a retail or uh, consumer bank, a business bank and corporate bank, they had product led verticals, which could be in payments, treasury, uh, you know, mortgage, corporate loans, deposits. So these could all be verticals based on the products they were offering. And based on how the products are, they were pushed to the customers. So, so this was a big change. And that's when uh, the demand then was to churn out products faster. Uh, and then soon as internet banking was getting more uh, effectively utilized, and the probably, uh, uh, you know, around 2007, 8, the mobile banking started uh, uh, becoming, uh, you know, prevalent in certain mar markets like Scandinavia was the first to start adopting it they adopted it you know in the late 90s also with web banking but then eventually they started sharpening those uh, in the market so 
here what was happening was while the industry was more focused towards giving more personalized service for corporate banking customers because our corporate customers because they bring in uh, large value transaction to the bank and hence your ability to service their needs sometimes your system your process your ops may not be able to do it right. um, but then when this start hitting the consumer banking thanks to the fang uh, customers in the retail started getting used to uh, you know certain some of these big techs so to speak uh, who are giving them a very different kind of an experience and for them the moment they used to one they are not going to differentiate that with any other products mm -hmm. right and then banks particularly were more for you know you know my here aware kind of put in a spot to start giving them a personalized service and in my previous job at suntech uh, you know we were building relationship based pricing now initially these were not that complicated because uh, the data sets the products that you are offering in a product centric world was very limited and we were able to give that level of personalization to whatever customer corporate business banking or even high net worth uh, or wealth customers mm -hmm. in the consumer side but eventually what started happening was the data spike that was happening because of the different uh, digital interaction channel interaction the customers were exposed to and once you have that then how do you start giving a more segment of one kind of an experience for your customer mm -hmm. and that could happen only when you are able to start using data to a big scale so problems we were solving with uh, let's say rule based algorithm uh, you know simpler algorithm built on certain rules framework or pricing models which were structured on certain parameters and you pick them up and kind of apply that and some of it is not real time you do it in post facto suddenly start transforming to like i want to do a payment now what's the cost for it and okay. if you don't tell me there are four five other options which are there so the way in which the instant gratification of what am i getting out of this transaction is this a better option or should i look for something else because the customer had the choice right so the relationship based pricing which is based more rule based and uh, you know simple algorithm based that we were solving post facto suddenly became real time immediate and there we had no choice but to use say, ai and data so uh, start learning customers see their patterns start putting neighborhoods and start solving for them so these were really a very clear problem you know one good example of uh, how a hyper personalization now it's been kind of heavily talked about across markets across industry mm -hmm. but very few have really solved that ragu in my view and mm -hmm. uh, it's not that easy given the scale and volume of transaction that are happening and what kind of data parameters do you look for and then how do you pick them up and who do you service you can't try and solve this for everybody you could right. have a you could large banks today have minimum of uh, over 100 million customers you know i'm talking the really large tier one banks so they obviously can't solve this for every customers that's the ideal state they want to be in but then if you start bringing those then who are your customers who bring more lifetime value and then you start solving so this is a classic example that i have seen mm -hmm. there are many such use cases ragu but this is a very classic example i've seen which has evolved over time where you have no choice but to use uh, leverage data algorithms and intelligence to solve it otherwise you are uh, out of the game very True. clearly so very well said uh, satish i really uh, can very much uh, relate to this even as a uh, normal uh, user of uh, some of these banking transactions 20 years back you had to even think about getting online to get into your bank account or even checking anything but now everything happens at the touch of a touch of your finger on your mobile yeah. and this is and these are i know these are many of these banks have i think if you don't do these you will disappear i think you are no longer in the competition i think uh, that's a very valid example uh, so what we do uh, satish i think maybe we'll take a quick break come back and then we sure. get into the main meat of our conversation for today sure <laughs> all right uh, welcome back so we have uh, started our conversation with satish and it's uh, very interesting that he gave some very good examples in the banking world so satish i think uh, since you have so much of this experience coming in from the industry and you have led many of these projects i would 
I, I, I have this question. Maybe I'm trying to put this question. How do you scale these uh, or how important is product management to scale development in these fintech projects? I know you have been involved in quite a lot of these different projects you have briefly explained. And how I know there is a, this is a very competitive landscape. Uh, so if you can provide some brief thoughts around that, that would be helpful. So, uh, Raghu, great question. In fact, uh, if you look at it, uh, you know, what I tell the team is that if you're thinking of an idea and you think this is a cool idea that you've come across or a cool problem that you've come across that you want to solve it, uh, be rest assured there are 100 people who are already solved for it, right? That's how fast this industry is uh, moving and uh, which is great eh, in a way because uh, uh, all these are going to make life a lot better for end user. Uh, but the, the bigger thing that I see here is that uh, uh, the whole industry is moving towards understanding the problem better, uh, solving it with the more product mindset because um, India as a market has largely been uh, with the tech boom uh, that we have seen a predominant percentage uh, works over close to 90 plus percent works on uh, service led industry, right? So of course we do over the years, we've evolved to do very niche quality kind of work on the service side. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you really look at it, um, some of the big product firms, the big product-based revenue firms are still largely out of, not out of India. We have very few in the in the country, right? So, right. Um, so how do you, you know, shift towards that? And in the recent times, uh, with a lot of investment coming in, not only to India uh, and other markets that we're seeing, uh, the the ability for the, the true success of such product organizations are happening when they they are truly able to see what the problem is, uh, understand uh, uh, what's the use case or what's the job of an of a particular user they are trying to solve and uh, how they're going to improve that particular uh, job for them with the use of their particular product or service, right? So. So when you look at these kind of problems, uh, uh, it starts with first identifying. So there is a lot of user research, market research one needs to do. Um, there are, because even if you take a very prominent problem in the market, there is 10 ways in which you could better that. And somebody has even solved it today and you're extremely happy with it. Mm -hmm. You will find there are 10 other things that you could do better. But you know, uh, so what I'm coming to is uh, any, any use case, whether it need not be a, like a unique use case that nobody has thought through and you kind of found that. I'm sure there are a few such use cases as well across that people are trying to solve. But more importantly, any use case you take, start doing um, the research in terms of, okay, which is the segment or basically which is the market I'm going to solve for within that market, which is the demographic that I'm going to solve for? How is this demographics currently using or you know attaining this outcome? What methods are they using for this? Um, what are the tools and services that they use to get that done? How satisfied or unsatisfied are they in a scale of one to 10? So these are aspects which go towards, uh, largely towards the research of the piece. I I'm not saying you spend months and mm -hmm. months together. Mm -hmm. There has to be very quick, smart research being done on this. And then this kind of, you should ideally speak to quite a few user groups, target user groups uh, that you're, because that gives you a first-hand view. They mm -hmm. might be using a set of application of products in the market. Uh, they're using some other ways, but then you need to understand, uh, you know, what are they using? What does the journey look like? Where are the friction points? What are the tools and methods they're using? How much time do they spend on it? What's the cost for the transaction? So there are various analysis one could do. So depending on the problems that we're trying to solve, the deeper you could go, it gets uh, more visibility uh, to the problem. So once you have a better data point, Mm -hmm. um, that also gives you a size of the market. So you sh certain problem statement, you can't get a data in terms of a, a revenue potential like a TAM, SAM, SOM coming out of any user research or market data because some of these problems are very unique. There is no data uh, that is available. You could probably use certain reference point and try to pro you know kind of extrapolate those numbers. Right. That's right. where the first part of the uh, puzzle actually starts working. And this is when you will so to speak, uh, look at this design thinking approach of uh, desirability, feasibility, viability. 
right and mm-hmm. uh, so the first one you know, all the research you're doing is to validate the desirability of what you're trying to solve will the customer pay a dollar for the service of the product you're building is it going to make an impact for them right and what's the scale of that impact and what's the size of this impact how many competition are there what's the potential of it so it's kind of desirability and uh, business viability will also come into play right so uh, this is the first part that uh, most often uh is not really uh you know looked at uh, by mm-hmm. many product firms and for me it's not necessarily ragu a um a kind of a fintech or a startup which is trying to solve a problem this could be a case with any product or application that let's say there is an established product uh, that we have sure. built or which sure. is in the market for the last 10 years you're trying to enhance certain pro- capability of the product that same even a simple epic or a user story that you're trying to take should go through this kind of an analysis i mean how far how deep you want to go as a call depending on the size of the change you're bringing in but if that approach comes into play then the quality of what you're going to add into your product becomes uh, extremely good and uh, so that in my view is the first part in terms of like what is the problem that i want to solve it's more like a strategy or vision and mm-hmm. it could apply as i said for a completely new company which is trying to get into a space and solve it you can do it end to end could be a new product that an existing company is trying to launch or it could be a module or a certain set of epic that you're adding into your existing product right and this thinking needs to go deeper because most often when a problem is said people start actually writing a code to it which is the right. easier part right. right and that's when these elements that could factor of course writing a code could help you get to an mvp but then um, but before you go into an mvp do these analysis because you today your time and essence are very critical and where you want to do those mvp where do you want to put those effort for those mvp matters as well so you could come with five different ideas do all these analysis and find out that uh, is there something that uh, you know of relevance for me to pick the any of these ideas sometimes you can trash all five ideas five ideas right so uh, so that's more on product what strategy vision what you want to do do the market research once you have sufficient market research you have drawn down who the persona like we said whose job are you trying to simplify would be the persona for that job you know then you start trying the journey flow see which are the elements that would be part of your product what would be the interface design those wireframes have those conversation with those persona because you need to understand what the persona is what their pain points right. so map that and then put the journeys and then start looking at what are the complex problems that you need to solve and touching the area that soft interest in specifically this podcast uh, one of the things that i've been very strongly doing or advocating within my team in the last 3 4 years has been towards mm-hmm. more of a data driven product management approach okay right so okay. so i'll give a quick example i think most of the industry experts are already doing it but like just to give a comparison of how it's normally done so typically there is a requirement um mm-hmm. in an a- existing enterprise application the way these applications were built then where okay what am i solving so they first build the ui or the user interface for that whichever way whether it's web mobile whatever and for that user interface whether it's a maintenance screen whether on submission there is a processing that needs to happen or there is a transaction that goes through they put those logic and for those logic they build certain small algorithm for those algorithms they'll go at the time of compilation they'll probably add a set of data elements in the database for that the compilation goes through and the data you know all the crud actions happen right so in this case if you look at it in a traditional model the database or data elements comes at the bottom of the pyramid mm-hmm. right whereas in the new world let's say i'm trying to solve a problem on let's say hyper personalization uh, as a case in point i would say okay hyper personalizing for specific transaction for a specific uh, use case then i go and say okay for this transaction what are the basic data elements that i would need that would be my starting point okay and uh, let's say i need the customer information within customer information these are four five parameters i would need and uh, let's say for the transaction these are four five parameters i would need how much of those data do i have within my uh, you know, within my application will that be captured how much of the data will it come through external source uh, let's say through integration how much of data 
will get populated post processing because they are data elements that i need but that mm -hmm. based on these elements i'll compute and you know kind of update the record so so here you first define what data elements you need and then then you go into where those data elements will be you know kind of utilized in that particular transaction mm -hmm. and then you put the flow and then design the logic and algorithm so this way your thinking is to do this transaction or to solve this problem what data do i need and right. split them into those categories that i called about and start using them so this way your sharpness in which you are consuming because what is the bigger problem today is that there is a huge amount of data that we have right we spend too much of time trying to trim it down to be able to consume what really matters to us but then if you start designing products in a data driven product approach then you're actually choosing what product data elements you need for that particular journey epic that you're solving for and the quality of data structure data element that goes into a product becomes far more sacrosanct because over a period of time ragu you are familiar you built enterprise product yourself over a period of time there is a lot of data you know suddenly you go and look at your database for your existing application and say oh my god i have so many data structures do right. i really need all of them? right so these are these are things that one could avoid so this is something again very early part of the design itself that uh, we bring in so post this what happens is then you actually get into an mvp mm -hmm. right so mm -hmm. now that you have certain user research conversation that you have had there are few who are quite keen right to say hey i want to be part of this you right. normally come up with those kind of people who will say i'm very excited about this so these could be your uh, early adopters or innovators who want to be part of your journey and they'll say i'm more than happy to be part of this because they equally it's something very close to them it could make an impact to their job they so you find these three four so the mvp is the you could kind of first bounce it off with them to see uh, you know what they feel about this and it's very important for a product person because sometimes um, what you want to solve you may not get all the answers from the market right so mm -hmm. your customers do not know what they want right and which is very true uh, because if you go to a customer landscape if you go through a particular uh, user journey that you're trying to solve there will be different roles that will be performing that particular job end to end in right. that uh, transaction life cycle and which means those different jobs have different roles they are part of different departments and then the complexity of this transaction many would not understand end to end they say hey my mm -hmm. job gets done here i don't know what happens beyond this right and then after that you talk to the other person so there are very few people who know end to end of what's really happening there and True. because people don't know this you can't go and ask these four five people what is their problem you could probably say what are you you can understand their jobs better but you don't try to find out what could you simplify for them so it's more of a product person to sit back and say okay the objective of this is to you know while doing this transaction is get this outcome probably this is the best way to do it and you could probably get inspiration from some of the other things that you look at i look at um you know nature a lot because as you know uh, as you know personally that i am very interested in uh, mm -hmm. wildlife and uh, photography and that i kind of relate to some of those to bring here so without digressing onto that for now so that's very important for somebody to be as a product person to look and start seeing how could a end user intuitively use your product which means you need to think a lot in terms of simplifying them their use case their problems right so that's the part and once you start building an mvp start validating this uh, with your user group it's very important that whatever you're trying you try fail fast is better because you can't be investing too much of your time and getting a uh, hooked on to your solution because right. most often uh, with application mindset people get hooked on to their solution they start loving the solution that they're building True. I True. would say, as a product guy, you should start loving the problem more, right? Yeah. So, yeah. you know, then you don't lose focus on the problem because you start so slowly. You would see, I've seen people who kind of get digressed on this, uh, working with different kind of people over the years. They start, you know, kind of seeing that their solution is the best that's going to solve, but sometimes they kind of lose focus on the problem, right? So that's very important to keep the focus on on what you're trying to solve. um so i'll kind of pause here ragu because we touched upon uh, the 
product strategy and vision what you want to do mm-hmm. so what's a problem you have picked up then we talked about user research mm-hmm. then you get a sense of the size of the market uh, uh, potential for this problem that you're trying to solve uh, then you do based on the research and other stuff you try to do a quick uh, mvp that you could validate uh, with a certain set of uh, innovators who would want to be part of this uh, this is good feedback method for you much early in the cycle Mm-hmm. and then of course uh, how do you bring the data driven element into this so so at this stage probably you have a sense and size of the problem you're solving the potential of the problem the user groups that you're going to target their personas uh, how complicated it is then your ability to sit back and see how best you could resolve it is very clear and with the data elements you know which are the data elements you're going to keep control of which are the elements you will compute which are the elements you will consume from external source so then you have group those into data models like let's say customer data transaction data behavior data whatever that you want to categorize them as so these design happens much early in the cycle it gives set the foundation pretty strong for whatever you're going trying to solve for of course i'll Pause here because there are further other things that will come yes. in terms of design, build, sure, estimation. Sure. So I have a follow-up question. I think you paused at the right moment about talking about this data-driven architecture and how important it is data. And we call there is this saying about data being the new oil, and I believe mm-hmm. that. that saying or that terminology is even more important and interesting in the fintech world because here when you talk about these transactions whatever this data driven architecture you have built and then the transaction in the product that you are building and the underlying thing is that you are the product that you are building is an underlying thing that for your financial transactions which will be maybe supporting a fintech firm or a banking firm so this is where trust comes a big trust plays a big role so maybe i think this is where i would like to take a tangential question here about how the banking industry is evolving now that you have been in this in this uh, industry or in this space for quite some time and then now with these fintech industries shaping up any thoughts about how this banking industry is in, uh, evolving and also maybe a few thoughts around this global banking industry and how important it is getting in the scheme of these things yeah i think uh, great question uh, ragu because uh, there's always an uh inflection point there's always a continuous pivot that keeps happening for any business that matters uh banking has been one of the i would say the oldest industry um in 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 the business that uh, we are in uh and it's been continuously evolving uh, it's very tightly regulated as well uh, so it becomes uh, far more challenging as well for banking entities to kind of balance out a lot of uh, innovation with data regulation like gdpr and similar stuff happening in every part of the world uh, there is there's a lot of uh, uh, concerns about uh, user data transaction data that are being utilized by so much and so it's very important for business to use those data to give uh, give more better service for their customers they equally have to be careful about how they are you know handling those data so definitely it's a very complex and to add to it uh, the kind of disruption that's happening for financial transactions uh, today is not only limited to fintech you know today banks do not know where the competitions are coming up right so right. so for example few years back uh, back in the us um, uber opened the maximum number of business banking mm-hmm. accounts right they just topped the chart they just beat every other top banks in the market and then um, and suddenly you found uh, uh, starbucks with their uh, prepaid uh, card uh, you know suddenly having a huge uh, uh, prepaid balance on their books right so where customers top the cards for coffee purchase and they 
the balance that each card were left out with was significant amount. And suddenly they started using, you could share the coffee, I could pay for you between if both of us were there. So, so the point today is that, uh, you know, you need not be a, a financial player to be helping customers on certain financial transactions. Mm -hmm. Mostly in the consumer side, this is becoming very prevalent, right? So uh, you go to a car dealer, um, to buy a car, there's a Toyota financial service, uh, for example, or a Mercedes financial service, or they have their own, uh, you know, credit options or a loan option that you don't have to talk to a bank, right? So, so of course, they must be riding on back of another bank or, uh, mm -hmm. uh, or an institution which has proper license to do it. But essentially, today, customers looking at getting a problem solved at a single place right and uh, uh you know the the complexity of these transactions could be very high in a corporate scenario um uh, in a corporate kind of a business transaction to a consumer transaction but then the end of the game is that how a financial institution uh leveraging what's happening in the market one right two um fintechs startups is no more competition, but then how do you go start partnering with them? Mm -hmm. uh, and so you start seeing a lot of banks now have, uh, uh, they have their innovation labs, they have a marketplace, they have ecosystems. Um, all these have started evolving thanks to open banking, which has kind of brought these uh, into the, into the uh, gamut. And globally, I think every country has been uh, building the open banking ecosystem. So definitely, uh, there is going to be uh, for financial institution to start partnering with the right uh, marketplace player uh, to drive more value for the customer. So they don't have to solve everything internally. They would still, the trust factor with banks is still higher. So, so even though they are the custodian of money, uh, most of other transactions, simpler transactions today, you and me start doing other other vehicles. We use other options to do those, which otherwise few years back you wouldn't have done outside a bank framework, but still they might still be riding on top of a bank framework, but there are easy and convenient choice that people are adopting to. Now, far higher in the consumer banking side, which is where the volumes are much higher. Uh, these kind of frameworks are happening. So banks would have to start partnering with them effectively, start seeing what are the core strengths, which are the core products and services that they would want to offer, mm -hmm. and then collaborate with partners where they feel they could bring in better experience for them. So the whole aspect of digital transformation that's happening in the, in the industry in the last few years uh, essentially has to solve two things. Uh, the success of a digital transformation has to truly solve two things. One is in terms of customer experience, and then two, in terms of employee experience. Mm -hmm. If these two are not solved, uh, any business transaction that you're dealing with, the customers dealing with that, with that entity, not necessarily a financial institution, any corporate for that matter, that transaction will not be seamless. The customer will not get that kind of experience that you're trying to drive and hence drive the better NPS and thereby driving them to do more business with you and give more reference of other customers coming in will not happen. So, so large institutions, corporates, banks, everybody are trying to solve these by journey by journey in terms of uh, uh, where they are higher impact journeys, they could pick them up and start solving them. So, and when they start solving them, they need to bring the best of technology. So they start thinking more like a tech driven. Mm -hmm. So you start seeing most of the chairmen, bank CEOs are suddenly not the CFOs who get right traditionally, you know, promoted to a CEO, start seeing now more tech-focused guys uh, taking those uh, positions within the financial institution, which is fantastic, right? So, right. because the industry is also understanding that uh, more tech-led uh, innovation, tech-led thinking is required in, a, uh, in whatever corporate or business you're running, uh, so that uh, your ability to then... Uh, fast track and drive certain objectives and outcomes you're trying to do will start happening. So to kind of uh, broadly summarize this uh, qu uh, uh, this question that you asked, Raghu, is one is uh, uh, banks are at that point where customer have way too many choices. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. uh, so while they're embarking on digital transformation, they carry a huge amount of technical debt and legacy. Uh, so how do they kind of transform, which will not only transform and give better experience for customer, they mm -hmm. need to transform from inside out because if employees are not, or the internal systems and employee experience is not good enough, those experience will not be able to translate sure. for transactions. Uh, there are competitions uh, uh, and I would say there are better options for certain uh, problems that the financial institutions are solving, being solved by fintechs and startups externally. How do they partner and leverage that and tie that in a manner that the, both the parties kind of uh, look up to it? And lastly, this brings more ways of monetizing um, oh. for the financial institution. So actually speaking, beyond interest income and fee-based income that has been improving, there are various methods. Suddenly, they could start charging for um, every, every market place entrant who wants to be part of that particular marketplace so and then once you're there then every transaction or every product or service you kind of sell that could be a percentage of that sale that could happen like the value so there are different ways in which you could do i talked about newer no, no, you know monetization method in cyber sydney a few years back and uh, i still feel that's still evolving and there are so many ways in which uh, the customer would see value and they would not mind paying the charge or fee because for them it's a convenience for them it's a single uh, uh you know a single source for accessing it what banks banks and corporates who are building these marketplace uh and bringing those uh, technology component around it is to look for is to ensure that their brand value um is kind of not compromised by the kind of partner and products that they're bringing in. So there has to be a lot of think through that has to happen on who should be part of that value chain that you're trying to solve for. Mm -hmm. So you would start seeing um, banks adopting more moving towards more cloud native. You start seeing a lot of uh, APIs. So today, most banks, you know, there are quite a few um, forward looking banks who have, can start exposing the APIs that they kind of offer. Uh, you start you start seeing uh, how they use data um, and start giving more better experience for their customers and also their employees in servicing them. So they are in this journey and the problem to be solved is far more big and complex. Mm -hmm. uh, but many of the uh, leading players have started in some of those players, you would see they are investing as in they're just not taking this over. They're investing on these kind of uh, uh, pr companies which they believe will not only service them, but could also help them grow in the manner. So these kind of uh, changes are happening in the market, which is really good. Uh, and I think this is also another exciting phase of the journey for the financial and no better time for people to be part of it. Right. And maybe I think with these uh, cryptocurrency and the digital currency as well, a lot of effects or a lot of influence would also be happening with that as well yeah right true true so there is defy there is um, cbdc a lot of these initiatives are coming up um so so it's going to be and many of the central banks are playing a large role like country like india mm -hmm. uh, the india stack uh, for easy identification upi is a framework for convenient payments um you know Aadhaar for identification upi for payments um now more recently uh, they are trying to, so there's been uh, for uh, more recently, they've been trying to bring more access of capital to the MSMEs and SMEs, uh, which are probably the largest contributor for any GDP. Uh, so mm -hmm. there's a lot of such initiatives that are happening and most of the central banks are taking these kind of initiatives globally. So real-time payment um, is becoming like, you know, while you know, I've been fortunate to be part of this journey. And as I said, last few years, I also got to work with one of the largest payment processor. Mm -hmm. uh, I've seen how financial inclusion becomes super effective when you bring certain uh, framework like this, which are driven by the uh, RBIs or the Reserve Bank of India or central banks. Uh, then the adoptions are much higher. The regulations are much more tighter. And in effect, it's kind of making life easier uh, for uh, uh, end user and the people who are trying to do business 
uh, in the in the economy, right? So, so there is definitely a surge in the adoption of real time payments globally. Mm-hmm. Every market is looking at it, um, and these are these are foundational framework for things to happen. And the fact that every government has also realized uh, um, the data becomes a very critical element. Data privacy becomes right. a critical element uh, for their own interest. Mm-hmm. Have uh, kind of put brought in these uh, data regulations uh, in uh, in their part of the world to make sure that uh, you know their interest and their their people interest are taken into uh, paramount importance. So. So a lot of good things happening uh, as we speak, and uh, I would say no better time than now. Right, amazing. I think uh, I like I like uh, the way you have uh, put together all these things, and I know, like you mentioned, we are in that best phase of the journey where all this transitioning is happening uh, with the help of the technologies that we have. Maybe we'll take a quick break and then come back and get into some more of these yeah. conversation. Sure. All right, uh, welcome back. So we've been having some interesting conversation with Satish uh, in the about FinTech and the influence of uh, AI in FinTech, the influence of how data-driven architectures are very important here. So I would like to ask uh, this question, uh, Satish, since you have so much of uh, this experience coming in from all this uh, banking and global banking, I keep hearing, I keep seeing a lot of commotion in the fintech space. We see a lot of startups. I know you have briefly touched based on this uh, aspect, but why do you see there are so many startups uh, or companies getting into this space now? Is there something... Uh, I know we are right off or we are still transitioning from the COVID phase. I think I believe this this journey or this fastening has happened during the COVID, if I may. Yeah, true. Uh, true, Raghu. I think uh, you're absolutely right. I think the pandemic has kind of uh, created a sense of urgency for digital adoption because we didn't have much choice uh, because all of us were locked in. <laughs> And uh, every business had to kind of quickly look at tools and technologies to start seeing how they could start functioning uh, without getting where they have to be. And uh, surprisingly, most of us have been able to do what we had to do, right? Apart from certain service industry, which kind of got heavily hit. Uh, mm-hmm. But but also this kind of opened up opened up the need for uh, need for many problems to be solved because a lot of these things were never envisaged right uh, you know until the pandemic hit us so so obviously there were suddenly the size of uh, let's say a zoom call like this suddenly became very very you know it became more of necessity and you would right. you would have noticed the number of adoption of zoom kind of uh, went over the roof right and it's a, a fair ask but to, subsequently then various other players came on to um, solve the same problem, right? So, uh, so these are the pandemic is definitely one aspect that has brought out this. Secondly, the industry on the whole, if you look at the investment that's been happening on fintech and startups, they've been showing a very positive trajectory over the over the last few years and mm-hmm. uh, a significant. I mean, um, uh, significant in a few few hundred billions have been invested and some of the top markets has been like US, China, India, uh, like in few parts in Europe, UK, right, Singapore. These are some very hot markets and of course Jakarta as well uh, in the Asian side. So, um, but the concentration of uh, investment that have been coming into markets like India because has grown tremendously in the last two, three years. Of course, barring the last few months because of the funding winter, which is more of a global thing, mm-hmm. I feel the bounce back will be a lot, lot higher. Uh, so I would not say it's commotion. I think it's a kind of mix back there. I'm, and these are my own view. I may be right or wrong uh, from whatever I have been uh, seen. Mm-hmm. Uh, so there is definitely, there are certain really genuine problems that the... Uh, few startups have been trying to solve right and uh, who are who are definitely getting 
I mean, if they get the right access to the right level of investors, uh, they get the right level of investment and funds which are going to make an impact. There are a few who are who are probably going through a kind of a valuation cycle. Um, and that's also calling for a lot of investment going in there. And that's something I don't want to comment so much. I'm not very uh, sure about some of the dynamics there. Mm -hmm. uh, but by and large, a uh, lot of seed funds. So even during this funding winter, if you take down the numbers, I don't have them handy offhand, but I've been reading a few reports on that very recently. The seed funding for a lot of uh, our angel investing has been continuously growing. There has not been any any slowdown at all in the funding right. winter. So, so which means uh, the market is still very clear on identifying problems. And thanks to funding winter kind of scenarios, uh, Raghu, what happens is more due diligence on what is the true size of the problem you're solving, uh, the impact it's going to make, and does it going to is it is it is it something that's uh, of value for both from a business you know, business viability standpoint and for people to put in their money and for in, uh, from a user standpoint, what is it really going to benefit them? So so this is going to continue. Uh, certain market dynamics post pandemic as in geography dynamics that has evolved has also benefited few geographies. Uh, so, uh, you know, India, for instance, has seen a further surge. I mean, we've always been getting a lot of... Uh, Right. Uh, investors uh, coming into India because of the talent pool, the kind of uh, uh, scale at which we've been solving. And our test grounds, uh, given the size and scale and the distribution of the demographics, is a fantastic playground to validate <coughs> a lot of these use cases. So, uh, so definitely, uh, post-pandemic, the numbers have grown for us uh, as a market. And uh, and today, it's, it's reaching a point where... Uh, uh, smart smart problems that are being or smart solution for uh, problems are very quickly picked up and taken globally mm -hmm. by the same entity or others start uh, picking up those ideas and solving it for their problem mm -hmm. so so i would say it's not it's not more of a commotion or any ragu i feel mm -hmm. there's a lot of buzz happening uh, of course uh, any kind of buzz will have uh, both good and bad things happening, right? So, um, but a majority of actions that are happening in the startup and fintech ecosystem is, uh, I would say, predominantly very good. Mm -hmm. It's encouraging most of uh, the youngsters to kind of uh, take up, uh, take up, uh, you know, uh, solving instead of taking up uh, entrepreneurship, the governments and uh, private bodies are kind of uh, encouraging those uh, and particularly you being based out of Valley, you have seen this uh, in action much more closely. And right. uh, the good part is a lot of these are now becoming more global. And uh, I would say this is a really good, good thing that's happening to the industry. And uh, um, not only big players are uh, bringing so if any any large corporate big players like the fangs or the large vc firms everybody are creating a lot of funds to be deployed it's about it's about the like i said in finance financial inclusion the problem that we try to solve is access to capital to the right people there are a lot of credit worthy people mm -hmm. but the credit worthiness is not known because they are not proud of your credit rating system and hence providing access capital to them becomes a constraint in the current structure uh, in many parts of the world. So that was one of the problems that I had solved in financial inclusion earlier. But the same thing applies for startups and fintechs and ecosystem. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of credit-worthy ideas. How do the industry and the body identify those and tap them in early? And, you know, it should go beyond tier one, tier two cities or more prominent cities. There are uh, problems being solved globally. I think with the uh, various means, these are being reached out, but that should be a better infrastructure to get this, uh, true. Uh, you know, penetrated better. Yeah. True, true. No, very well said. I think um, this is, I know this, uh, you have answered this question, uh, but I want to put it in a different way. I know 
we talked about the startups we talked we talked about these big tech firms like the big five the amazon google apple fb alibaba they all coming into the fintech space or coming into the banking space as well many of them have their own banking cards as well um, and a lot of technology getting invested this is a question like when i talk with any finance finance gurus or the finance tech gurus i keep asking does it make cash a non entity in the future what are your thoughts and what do you think i know before we get off to the key takeaways and closing remarks maybe i wanted to put this question to think around for you to answer and also maybe uh, for the audience also to think about right and do you think uh, what what do you expect in the future see i think uh, definitely if you see the data points today uh, in most market like if i take india as an example itself we have been a very cash um, cash usage country right and uh, but today uh, today if you look at the data of the upi transaction that are happening right so you could go uh, do a transaction for like 1 cent or equivalent right. of that right. in india right so and uh, those transactions are accepted they are done real time and the scale up is these happens during any festivity for example the recent one spike that we had was during new year e uh, so the transaction kind of went over the roof diwali and there are certain spikes that happens but on average these numbers are going uh, the transaction volumes are going over to 8 9 billion and uh, they bound to grow they're going to soon hit double digit uh, but still still is uh, for a scale of population like ours uh, uh, there is still a significant portion of transaction that happens on cash uh, the intent is to move completely digital so eventually i think uh, cash will cash will fade away uh because there are more easier convenient better options uh, that are there in the markets right so uh so i don't see the cash sustaining for way too long um and it's going to be largely uh digital payments uh, ragu so i think it's more about how those infrastructures right. are set up right so like the india stack is a beautiful case in point for that to start happening True. um uh, and uh, that's kind of set up this uh, phase for us and now i think it's more about uh, uh taking to those scenarios trying to understand where are those scenarios where still cash are prevalent and how could we avoid uh, uh how could we avoid those so the percentage of cash will go down but probably they'll exist but there are other initiatives as you know are happening like cbdc defi a lot of things are coming up we're focusing towards uh, this but today most of the urban users uh or even in some part of the rural i would say most of the predominant in urban user today you don't even uh, you just walk out with your mobile phone right, right. and uh, most of the payments are ubiquitous you don't even feel that payments is happening and that's a level of maturity that has happened uh, whether you take a uber ride or you order something online uh, you know you want you get your groceries in 10 minutes uh, most of these are happening ubiquitously right you don't even check whether those transactions happen because they have set up configured they're happening seamlessly uh, the security is far more better so customers are very conveniently adopting to those so uh otherwise normally these cash transaction today are completely out of the out of the window so so i think uh, digital is already there i think digital payments is already there i think most most countries are getting on to setting up this similar real time payments infrastructure so if you go and look at the landscape of real time infrastructure that are being deployed as we speak the numbers are just uh, fantastic quite a few real time payment system which have been there a few years back are not able to meet this kind of volumes that we are hitting like an upr or something so they are going on to an upgrade phase uh, so you should probably have a look at it that will give you an idea so those are then sets the foundation for these uh, digital adoption to be higher and new new ways of uh, uh, methods that the central banks are you know kind of introducing will also kind of make cash a uh, um uh, 
you know something that may not be really required uh, for anybody to deal with so which is great so right. we are in the right direction i think uh, uh, this is very soon bound to happen uh, and we are already seeing that in scale uh, sitting here in india and i'm sure you are experiencing it in uh, many parts in the us as well yeah right a lot more i think uh, like, like you very well mentioned i think the trust in the systems are increasing a lot with these mm-hmm. uh, technology players coming in and playing hand in hand with the banking system uh, and the fraud is kind of going down a bit going down and down and pre- eventually i think it will be curtailed so yeah a lot of uh, positives with uh, how these data driven architectures are helping the fintech world and how it is shaping up uh, the fintech world great uh, great thoughts uh, from you satish so i know um, uh, this is a very interesting conversation and we could go long hours together on this uh, but uh, i would uh, want to uh, see if you can provide some high level key takeaways or closing remarks from your end about uh, your experience i think you you did talk about a lot about it already but any closing remarks that you would want to provide for the audience i think uh, ragu so uh, once again thanks for having me in this podcast and uh, uh, you know today i think we kind of spent a lot of time on uh, uh, briefly touched upon product management and how product thinking um, largely led by design thinking and using data as a fundamental element uh, should become a way of life uh, in any product application that one is building uh and then we also kind of spend a little bit on what's happening in the financial industry some of what i talked about though it could be specifically financial industry kind of applies for any large uh corporates in any large industry that it could kind of completely connect to it uh, so i think uh, we couldn't spend much time on the data analytics and uh, those elements in today's conversation uh, but let's see how this podcast gets received by your audience ragu because uh, uh, i think i spend a lot of time these days in as i said building the data model for a use case before i start solving mm-hmm. the use case mm-hmm. and uh, the way i look at data in terms of solving any use cases uh, very simply put first i need to know what those data are which i talked about earlier right like you know for this particular problem what are the data elements how they what's the source of those data once i identify that once i have the data then i start learning from the data so then your ml comes into play without that first set of data i will not be learning mm-hmm. so the learning then starts happening for the transaction if i just take a simple transaction like as an example who are the kind of customers using it what channels are they using it what values are they transacting on you know i'm just taking a random example so this gives me some level of learning from it basis that learning and which could have a higher impact for me as a business or impact and what are the reason why certain people are not using certain transaction which i kind of believe how could i nudge them right. so once the learning starts right. happening then i could once i have the learning improves then my intelligence improves that's when i start applying ai right so there is a journey to it so people start saying hey why can't you put an ai based application and yeah sure that's the journey but then you know is your data sorted how mature is your data within your organization or within your product or within your application with your use case they're solving once you know the data then we start learning out of it first are you learning enough about what the product is doing for your customers or uh, do you understand enough of uh, how they are consuming a product what's happening so once the learning starts happening then it becomes a feedback to go rejig your product we add certain data you know so that's a cyclical process once the learning then you start getting into more predictive and prescriptive because then you know certain things you don't know your users to think and these are stuff that you could completely automate using ai and so it's a journey by itself and uh, um, while while every every use case in uh, epics that we build has a, a potential to leverage an ai but then how do you build this app and go there is something that you need to sit back start designing and start looking at it so so i'm sure uh, those are aspects we couldn't cover today ragu but right. uh, you know right. that's an area i would want to we should definitely connect here yeah, yeah and maybe 
uh, we could have this uh, follow up sometime down the line basis how this has been received and also in product uh, part i couldn't really get into the entire life cycle so so if there are a lot of interest on that part of uh, uh, how do you take it through the life cycle uh, how do you run product led growth how is organization designed to drive product led growth because in a customer centric context how do you uh, drive those such certain things we could touch upon but i would say i think you kind of uh, kind of at the right point brought in about the right set of questions and uh, kind of helped me uh, navigate through those we definitely touched upon many topics today but i'm sure that you uh, your audience would uh, enjoy listening to it and uh, and look forward to having follow up conversation uh, whenever uh, you feel the time is right ragu and sure. once again thanks for having me in this podcast sure amazing and uh, thank you satish for your time and look forward to again getting you on board uh, uh, in the next few months or so and we can go much more deeper into the data and analytics part of it with ai thank you again super thanks ragu All right, let us now wrap up this podcast number 42. I would first like to thank our guest Mr. Satish for his valuable time in having this conversation and discussing the various aspects of how AI is influencing the fintech world. He has also provided some interesting conversations and thoughts around how data is being leveraged uh, to process because there is this humongous amount of data Uh, when we are also talking about these financial transactions and how the new age data architecture is transforming the way these financial institutions are operating and we did discuss about how the banking industry is also evolving rapidly in the response to the rise of fintech and ai i learned quite a bit i hope this was useful to you folks as well if you have any further questions or would like to have some further conversations feel free to reach out to mr satish directly uh, i am i will be tagging him in the social media linkedin message post alternatively you could also reach out to me raghubanda and i can put in touch with him as always uh, you could go into extraai.com x t r a w a i.com and you could also find a wealth of other uh, podcasts that are available on various different topics like we do uh, if you have any additional feedback feel free to send that feedback to any of my social media handles like ragu banda on linkedin or rk banda on twitter or alternatively you can send a message on my website extraai.com x t r a w a i.com stay tuned for many more interesting conversations in this season 5 and finally i would like to thank you all the audience for sitting through this conversation and providing your valuable feedback as always happy predicting the future with ai technologies bye bye